Five minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. If you're into science fiction, uh, then you probably are familiar with the L. Ron Hubbard Presents Writers of the Future book, Volume 31, which uh, we've been talking about for a while now. We've been getting to meet some of the uh, authors and illustrators that are featured in, in the new book. Uh, and I believe this is like one of the first years that that book has hit number one on the, is it the Barnes & Noble uh, list or, yes. or maybe yep. New York Times. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Shoemaker is on the phone, so we are going to meet him right now. He is an award-winning author. the The story in uh, Volume Thirty One that he wrote is called Unrefined, but there's also uh, some uh, good news. Uh, we're going to hear about another story he wrote called Today I Am Paul. Uh, Martin is um, a programmer. It says here, and uh, my notes indicate he's calling from his job. Uh, he was named MVP by Microsoft for his work with the developer community. He play, He's an avid role-playing game master. That's pretty cool. Wow. And, and a Writers of the Future award winner. I guess I was redundant there. Martin Shoemaker, good morning, sir. How are you? Pretty good. Nice to talk to you folks down there someplace where it's sunny. And where are you, in Michigan? I am in Michigan, and we're trying to dodge the freezing rain. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for being on the air with us today. How, uh, so you, you are at your job right now? I took a break. I, I took my lunch early to talk to you folks. Okay. And, and, and so is this the, 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 the part of you that is the author? Is it changing you? Are, are you becoming some? Are you Paul? What, is today, <laughs> what does that mean? Today I am Paul. Well, uh, today I am Paul is the story of an Alzheimer's patient and the android caretaker who has to pretend to be her family when they can't be there. Oh. It opens up with him having to be her son, Paul, because Paul's not there. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. What a fascinating idea. No wonder you're getting rave reviews. Yeah, it's striking a chord with a lot of people, people who have been through issues with elderly parents and also people who fear that you know this could be me too because it's in the family so i think it's it's reaching a lot of people so do you do you um do the ideas come to you like i'm, I'm guessing at your job you're hands-on with things computer related and, and and while you're working on those things does your brain take you to places that that end up as stories Mostly it's, it's separated out that what, during my day job I have to think about computers and we actually we do uh, software that does diagnostics for truck transmissions. So I have to be immersed in that world, mm. but I have about an hour commute home each day and an hour commute in. And so part of my decompression from work is I start thinking about stories, and by the time I got home, get home, I'll probably have dictated something that I can then transcribe to start a new story. Oh, that's fascinating. How long have you been doing that? I have been dictating the stories for about uh, three and a half years now. I probably should do it more because everything I sold in the last two years was dictated first. And it's still sometimes I sit down to type without dictating because I think I know better this time. Mm -hmm. do you, do oh, really? But it doesn't work out. It works out better when you, when you kind of just rambling in the car. I, I think so. It's it's getting the story that's in my head directly out without any interference. I just talk to myself in the voice of the characters and talk through what they're feeling, and that gets the pure vision out into a concrete form that then I can transcribe that is a cool, and that, rearrange and clean up. That is cool. I, we've, we have spoken to so many authors. I don't think we've ever had one tell us that before. No. Mm -mm. Uh, Kevin J. Anderson, I'm sure you know his name, he dictates pretty much everything he writes now. Uh, he is a much more successful author than me, and he has a transcriptionist or two who do the transcribing from there. Mm -hmm. I honestly, I think I gain more by by doing the transcription myself because essentially the transcription is my second draft. Yeah, then you so you can rewrite it, you can rephrase things, right, and and, and move things around mm -hmm. maybe if they need to be. But but it's hard to argue with Kevin's success. So because <laughs> he's Star Wars, yeah. right? He's he's written the Star Wars. He has written Books. Star Wars stuff. He has done adaptations in a number of different series, and he's also done some very excellent work on his own. Uh, he's done collaborations with Neil Peart from Rush. 
Oh, which is an we've odd had one. him. Yes, yes, we've had yeah, him we've on. Had him on yeah. we've, now that they say that, yeah, I was, yeah. I was thinking we had him on, but when you made the connection with Neil Peart, then I said, oh yes, we've had him on for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Oh wow, so this is exciting stuff. So when did you get the word that? Okay, so let's let's talk about the contest because that's why you're talking to us. The, exactly. You, you got involved with the contest when? Um, I was at a point in my life where I thought I'd try writing one more time because I've tried off and on for 40 years and I thought I'd try one more time and I wasn't getting anywhere so I basically said okay I give up I'm going to concentrate on the programming but I'm going to send out this one story one more time where am I going to send it out and it happened to be the last day of eligibility for the year because it was New Year's Eve last day of eligibility for that quarter for the year so I just sent it out, and then I forgot it. I went back to programming, and three months later, I get a call from Joni from Writers of the Future telling me my story has been selected as a finalist, and suddenly I rethought all my priorities. Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, my, oh my gosh. And, and do you have, like, a, a, like a, a self-published – like, have you self-published things and, like, distribute them to your family? And did you, did, were you able to get feedback regarding your writing, or, or has it always been something self-contained? Uh, I do get some feedback. Um, I, I know this is against all the writing advice in the world, but my mother is one of my first readers, but she doesn't hesitate to tell me what she doesn't like about it. And then I have three friends who read pretty much everything I, I write. Uh, two of them are fellow authors, so we trade back and forth. And then a third is a friend of mine who's a journalist by training and an editor, and he reads everything. And then I've got other writers that we trade stories back and forth. Did you do the French translation and the Israeli translation yourself for Today I Am Paul? No, nope, those were uh, those were translated by the magazines themselves. It's it's a pretty common practice that they do their own translations. They also don't pay a whole lot, but it's nice to reach those markets. As a matter of fact, the Israeli translation came out just two hours ago today. Wow! Oh, that, that is, is cool. so amazing. That is cool. Have you heard it? it, it, it do they do? It, is the uh, entire anthology is it available as an audiobook by chance? It is not yet. That is one of the things that, after the success they've had this year, they want to look into an audio book for it next year. Um, but this year, they just they didn't expect the success level to be quite where it was, so they hadn't planned for that. And and next year, they're saying, if we can do this good this year, let's do better next year. So I think that's on their plan. Yeah. Are, are you thinking of um, making any of your stories into a series? Uh, the um, uh, uh, novella Mo- Murder on the Aldrin Express, that, that seems like it could be. Uh, actually, that one, which was in uh, Year's Best Science Fiction two years ago, that one has become a series, definitely. I didn't know it when I wrote it, but again, one of my writer friends who who reads all my stuff, she kept telling me, you need to write more stories about these characters. I have now sold four of those stories to Analog, and one of them was uh, recently, well, actually, it was Murder on the Aldrin Express, was recently reprinted again in Forever Magazine. The, the one thing I think that we, we've come to learn about science fiction writers is that we, we often think of them as uh, uh, seers, like... Uh, I don't mean the store. I mean like... S-E-E-R-S. Yeah, like, you know, fortune yeah. teller. Like, like, it seems like when you look back, um, there, were, there have been science fiction writers who've predicted the future. Not just with technology, but sometimes even with sociology. Just the way society has, has become. Oh, 1984 is a great example of that. He mm-hmm. had the year wrong, but, mm-hmm. but it is kind of like that now, isn't it? Well, I think that's sort of like astronomers. If you look at a pool of 100 astronomers, one or two of them will have a few right predictions every year, and that's what gets remembered. Okay, okay. Because there's a lot of science fiction published every year that that can't be pointed to as predictions. Okay. Yeah. I think we try in our own way to imagine a consistent future, but what we're really describing is a world as we understand it today. And so as long as humanity doesn't change, human nature doesn't change, we probably will get some predictions right in terms of how people react, even if we get the technology wrong. Let's take a little break, and, and we'll be right back. I want to ask some questions about the technology versus the human element uh, in the stories. We'll be right back. 
the weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. We'll see a couple of showers during the morning hours of Friday. Otherwise, a mostly cloudy day with a high of 73 to 77. Partly to mostly cloudy and mild Friday night with some fog around late at night, low 58 to 62. On Saturday, morning fog patches, otherwise mostly cloudy and warm with a couple of showers and a thunderstorm, especially during the afternoon hours. A high Saturday, 76 to 81. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Career Source Citrus Levy Marion brings together business and community partners, economic development leaders, and educational providers to connect employers with qualified, skilled talent, and job seekers with employment and career development opportunities. Tune in the first and third Wednesday of each month at 9:30 a.m. to Career Source Citrus Levy Marion and learn how they can help you. Gene Powell Pasture Mowing. Gene and Debbie would like to thank you for another successful year of business. We also want to wish everybody a safe, healthy, and prosperous 2016. We are ready to be of service with our pasture mowing. 352-629-2440. Locally owned and operated, experienced and reliable, commercial and residential, licensed and insured. Powell Gene, G-E-N-E at yahoo.com. 352-629-2440. Gene Powell Pasture Mowing. 352-629-2440. All right, 16 minutes after 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. On the phone is Martin Shoemaker. And what we've already learned from Martin, I mean, just, just a, a thumbnail sketch is all we really know. And, and he's obviously a brilliant guy in, in several different ways and a creative guy. And so many times, because we do a radio show, we have people who are authors who um, have, have come into the studio. They said, can you, can you, or into the offices, rather. And they say, can you, can you look at the book? Can you consider having me as a guest on the show? And we say, sure, just leave the book and we'll, we'll look it over. And sometimes we're just blown away by how well um, people write. And they're usually self-published. Uh, I mean, Rob and I have a lot of the big names, too. But, but I'm saying locally, people from around here. Mm-hmm. They come in and they will have these books. They're well-written. They're, they're well thought out. It's, it, they've worked with editors and they've, they've gone through the whole routine of uh, sitting in with the, the writers groups and, and honed their craft so to speak and we invite them in and I always think gosh if they could hook up with, with a publisher um, as opposed to the self-publishing people have had success stories with self-publishing so I'm not trying to cut that down in fact I know a few but the point is that you hook up with something and there is no better avenue that I've ever heard of than the contest the uh, L. Ron Hubbard Writers of, and Illustrators of, of the Future contest a couple of reasons first of all because they deliver what they say they're going to deliver they really help launch careers Mm -hmm. second because it costs nothing it does and and i've often thought if you have a contest that costs something then your mission is to get as many people to enter as possible so you can make a bunch of money Mm -hmm. but in this contest they they don't make money unless they find some good stories because they're going to make the money when they publish the book right exactly. right and at the same time then they're going to launch the the careers of some um some deserving writers martin you clearly fit into that category Mm -hmm. so um so finding the contest itself must have been i mean did you have any reluctance at all any resistance because i'm sure you entered other contests uh, actually, I had not, I was, and I will be honest, I kind of did have some resistance that I was more aimed at traditional markets. It was just literally the what the heck of, this is the last day, this is the last day I'm going to submit anything, it lines up right, and I'm a, I'm a fan of coincidence. When coincidence happens, I like uh-huh. to follow it and see what happens. Hmm. So I learned everything about the contest after my first finalist story. That's when I started paying attention and oh, saying, really? oh, this is what this is about, and this is why this is important, and this is how many people that I know are involved in this contest. Wow, wow. And, and did they hook you up with an illustrator? I'm pretty sure they do with everybody, right? But for each story in the book gets illustrated. Uh, mine was illustrated by a wonderful illustrator, one, uh, one of the illustrator winners, basically, an illustrator from San Francisco, uh, Tung Chi Lee, I probably butchered her name, for which I greatly apologize. She goes by Jessica here in America. Uh-huh. She is Chinese-born, has moved to America for her graphic arts career. And when I saw her picture for my story, I just about wept. Right. Mm-hmm. She captured oh, really? everything oh, about nice. that scene perfectly. And uh, your winning uh, story was called Unrefined? Yep. 
Yep, that's it. It basically is a story of what happens to a vision when the visionary dies, and in this case, his widow and his best friend have to salvage his dream from all the pieces and the sabotage that killed him, and make it real to keep their space colony alive. Oh my gosh, that is just so amazing! The space colony. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and so, so let me, let's talk about that, the, the science fiction versus the, the human story in, within the science fiction, uh, using Star Wars just as an example. Star Wars' story could take place on Earth. It doesn't have to be in space. I mean, there's so many human elements to, to that story. And just based on what you've told us so far, I mean, just the the part of uh, the story uh, today, I am Paul with the Alzheimer's. I mean, to me, it sounds like there's more of a human element there than a technology element. Am I right? I think the best stories in science fiction are about humans in the world of the technology, or in the world of change in general, and how we respond to change, and also universals that that yes there's changes but we are still humans underneath so we still have the same fears the same desires and so on but but to see those in contrast or or illuminated by a different environment can often give give a new perspective on it hmm. did, and, did you benefit from the mentoring of of the uh, the folks over at, at the uh, writers of the future contest absolutely uh, we had uh, David Wolverton, you might know more by his pseudonym, uh, David Farland, mm -hmm. and Tim Powers, who um, was, has written a number of stuff, including some of the stories that uh, Pirates of the Caribbean were based on. They taught us for a week, and then towards the end of the week, the judges who had read all the stories started coming in for the big gala presentation and started giving separate, uh, separate presentations dur during the regular workshop. And so we got to hear from all of these different writers, all of these different established pros, their perspective on different parts of the business. And that helped a lot to realize that there are lots of ways to do this. There are lots of tools you can learn, and then you have to find the ones that work best for you. I like uh, how in your uh, uh, bio that you have a lot of different influences in your life. I mean, you grew up uh, with a uh, manual typewriter. You couldn't even <laughs> reach the keys. And then when you were in your algebra class, uh, your algebra teacher was the one that tried to uh, steer you in the direction of programming. Yep. Ironically, his wife at that school was the English teacher, so they had me going in both directions. Oh my gosh! So. Uh, the uh, the um, our, our guest right now is Martin Shoemaker. He is up in Michigan, where it's freezing rain. No no snow right now, just freezing rain. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and the story that is in the uh, Writers of the Future volume thirty one thirty one is is called uh, Unrefined, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to get that. I think if we ever went out to one of these uh, events. One of these award ceremonies. I think we would know everybody in the room by now. We've spoken to so many people. Yeah, I think from, so. From, from the, especially from this volume, right? From volume sure. thirty-one. Sure. Sure. What, uh, what was that like for you? I mean, I'm looking at a picture right now. You're in a, in a tuxedo. It looks like you're accepting your award. It looks like was that? I mean, that looks like a, a Hollywood moment for to me. And it is Hollywood. I mean, you're you're right there. It, it it is, and in fact, they are because they're set in Hollywood. They are very sensitive to image and appearance and how it can can draw attention and make people excited about the project so they help us a lot to make sure we're looking our best because writers don't tend to when we're left to our own devices <laughs> <laughs> that's funny have you ever been at a uh, uh, social gathering whether it was family or work and then an idea struck you and you just had to excuse yourself to dictate it somewhere or are you lucky enough to be able to retain it and then as soon as you get home you run with it uh it it's a mix um actually driving to christmas dinner a couple of weeks ago all of a sudden i had to pull up my phone and dictate a scene because i suddenly realized exactly the right conversation for that scene and I did not want to spend a good five, six hours with family and forget all about it. Oh, my gosh. Did, do you have anybody in your family that is afflicted with Alzheimer's? I do not. Uh, my mother-in-law had Parkinson's, which is what I really drew the story from was her last year of life. But I felt like 
everyone knows Parkinson's for the tremors. Right. And I hadn't realized the, the mental conditions that come with it as well. And I felt like it would be just simpler to translate that in Alzheimer's to not get the contradiction. But, but towards the end, Parkinson's is a brain disease, and it starts giving a lot of the same dementia issues and so on. I didn't, I didn't so, even know so that. Really, yeah, so, so metaphorically, this is the story of her last year of life. Hmm. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow, wow. And, uh, Sue, uh, while you are uh, doing your job and then you found out that she would be going on this trip, did you get a lot of encouragement from others? Oh, yeah. I, I think everybody appreciates the, the idea that authors are out there in their midst, that they like to be able to know that, oh, there are real people writing and telling these stories. And that's honestly, that's part of a lesson of the contest and the workshop as well is we get to know these authors as people just like us as opposed to some, someone out there that just pushes books out and they've got some separate life. And it's like, no, they're just like us. We, if they struggle with these issues and we struggle with these issues, it's, more, it's easier to see that we can overcome them when we see that people like us have in the past. And it's just really wonderful that you're very, very versatile. You don't have to stick with one genre to write a good story. Uh huh. Because in some sense, I mean, there there are conventions for every genre, but in some sense, story is story is story across all of them. It is all about a, a character that the reader can invest in facing a problem in some sort of setting they can believe in and how they struggle with that. And once you get that basic in, then you look and say, well, what's different about this, sit this setting? Oh, this is a Victorian mystery, so I need to make the problem and the character fit that setting. And but it, it's still character setting problem. And it, it, it seems that you would be an excellent speaker at a writer's group. I, I hope so. I actually spent 10 years as a uh, software design instructor, so I'm really comfortable in front of a group. I'm actually less comfortable in like a party situation, but you put me in front of a microphone, I can go for hours. That's Which, me too. That's the way I am too. Let's not do that today. That's the way I am too. Yeah, put me in a party. I'm just going to go over to the buffet and eat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, unless I, the, you know what happens, Sophie, and this probably happens to you too. When you, when you, okay, let's say you and I, we don't know each other. We're over by the buffet, you know, dipping our crackers, and, and, <laughs> and, and we start to talk. Then all of a sudden, I find something interesting in, in another person, and that's when the talkativeness might happen. Would, is that true for you too? A absolutely. That all of a sudden there's a connection, there's a reason for the discussion. Yeah. What I can't do is with small talk. I don't get it. <laughs> but when, when there's something there that that I connect with this person now, and I want to know more about this, I want to understand this person, then I'm off and running. Well, that is really true. I love that because because um, I always say my favorite stories are those that tell stories of people's lives, and it doesn't have to be true. It can be it can be fiction because I always think that a fictional story about somebody's life is is still a story about somebody's life. Yes. And whether it's a it's a covert way of of telling the story of your own life for the, from the author's point of view, it's, it's I guess is each book is individual in that way. Uh, I just went to the website, um, the uh, writers of the future dot com. I think is where I went. It, mm -hmm. it took me to galaxypress dot com, and so I see the book Writers of the Future, volume thirty one, the L. Ron Hubbard presents book. Um, and and you're you're listed on here as well as the authors, and and I I mean as the illustrators. Um, this is pretty exciting stuff. Now, does this disqualify you from, from entering in the future to this contest? There, there are many things that can disqualify you. Basically, it is a, a contest for amateurs. Now, their definition of amateur gives a little wiggle room, but once you've won this contest, no. You're considered a professional now. You're out. With one loophole, there is not winning, but there's what they call the published finalist. Often there will be room in the book for one more story than the 12 winners. Ah, okay. And the coordinating judge, uh, Dave Wolverton, will go through the finalists for the year that didn't make the cut, because there's, there's eight every quarter, but only three get published. Uh -huh. He'll go through the rest and say, that one deserved to be a winner. And so that person doesn't get the prize money, but they do get a publication credit. 
and their story shows up in the book, nice. but they're still eligible. Nice. Martin, wow. Schum Mar Martin Shoemaker, good luck with everything. Definitely uh, come back anytime to promote any future books you have, and, and, and good luck with everything you're doing. Go, go to uh, writersofthefuture.com. We'll take a break and be right back. Will administration officials talking terror today with executives from some top tech companies, including Apple, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Dropbox, Microsoft, LinkedIn. All of these companies have had major issues with terrorism recruitment on their platforms or in their storage sites. Jill and Kent with the Fox Business Network arrested on terror charges. A California man and this one. Omar Faraj Saeed Al-Hardan of Texas was indicted on three charges he tried to provide material support to ISIS. Al-Hardan is the 80th person charged under federal law in an ISIS-related case since April 2013 and the first in 2016. Fox Radio's Tanya J. Powers and a Philadelphia police officer ambushed by a gunman as he sat in his police cruiser said to be in stable condition. He was able to return fire, hitting the suspect at least three times. He's been caught. Fox News, we report, you decide. You know the story of Hansel and Gretel, where Hansel left breadcrumbs on the trail so they could find their way back home? That's what you do when you use public Wi-Fi, or shop online, or give out your social security number at your doctor's office or the bank. You leave breadcrumbs on the trail for someone to possibly steal your identity and take everything you own. At LifeLock, we use proprietary technology to detect signs that someone has picked up your breadcrumbs to take what's yours. And unlike free credit monitoring services that only alert you, we have a dedicated resolution staff to help clean things up if all those breadcrumbs get messy. No one can prevent all identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But with LifeLock, you can keep doing the things you do every day and feel better protected. Isn't it time to help protect yourself from someone eating your financial lunch? Plans start at $9.99 a month. Right now, you can get 10% off. Go to lifelock.com.